Okay, let's see what you guys think. Why are there no subtitles? Now there are subtitles. Okay, now let's see what you guys think. Uh, group one, your question is about the changing understandings of right and wrong between grade school and college. Do you agree with the first of all, what does this mean? And secondly, do you agree? Why? Why not? OK, so group one's answer is um, they agree with the first sentence, but they sorry, they disagree with the first sentence, but they kind of agree with the second sentence. So let's look at this. The first sentence says in school, the reiteration of the right and of authority's limits was the affirmation of friendships bonds. This means that uh, when you make friends, your friends all agree with you about what is right, what is wrong, and who gets to decide what is right and what is wrong. Usually that person would be a teacher or a parent, some kind of authority. Uh, and group one disagrees. They think that uh, when you're in grade school and you make friends, it's for many different kinds of reasons, not simply uh, because you agree about what is right, what is wrong. Now, but they do agree with the second sentence uh, that if you live in a college dormitory and you have to live with very different people, then sometimes you will have to put aside your idea of what is right, what is wrong, if your roommates have different ideas. Otherwise, it's impossible to live with them, right? But as they also mention, uh, outside of a dormitory, like if you're taking a class with someone that you disagree with, you don't have to accept them. You can just sit on the other side of the room, right? OK, I think that makes sense. Uh, but I do want to ask one more thing. Uh, if in college you don't have to accept someone who has different ideas of right and wrong, how can you say that you could make friends with them? Uh, OK, so it's not like yes or no, right? It, it depends on the person and how different your ideas are. Ah, so whether you have a shared understanding. So uh, even if you sometimes disagree with your friend about what is right, what is wrong, in general, it doesn't make it impossible to be their friend. So I guess the first part of your question is not you disagree, but you think it's not the only thing uh, that goes into a friendship. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. Uh, other groups, do you want to add your ideas about question one? Okay. Let's move on to question two. Th these guys, uh, and also our online classmate. Um, so this question is asking about changing ideas of also about right and wrong, uh, but about how people think about right and wrong. So uh, group two, can you kind of explain for us the difference between multiplicity and relativism? OK, sure, if you want to answer the first one first, go ahead. OK, they, let me, uh, let's take them one by one. OK, so uh, group two says that these two quotations from the article seem to be saying the same thing, basically. So the first quote, uh, one day you wake up and you realize that the same thing might look different to different people, but we must all we must still all stand judgment, which means when someone like a teacher walks up to you and asks you, why do you believe this? You should be able to explain your reasons. Or when someone says that's a you're wrong, you should be able to defend your belief. The second sentence says anyone has a right to his own opinion. Uh, so you can believe whatever you want to believe. So it does sound very similar to the first one, right? Pe different people believe different things. Uh, the first sentence adds a slightly additional idea that you have to be able to defend your belief. That's not exactly apparent in the idea that everyone has a right to their own opinion. But I tend to agree that these two are very similar. Uh, as for how they might be more different and what is the difference between relativism and multiplicity. Uh, we'll talk about that after a break. Okay. I mean, Chenda, okay, Lai Zibin Chen.
So when we're talking about everyone has a right to their own opinion. Usually when we say this in daily life, it means I disagree with you, but whatever, fine, right? I, I don't want to argue with it uh, about it with you. Maybe I've tried to argue with you and I can't make you believe me. So fine, you believe whatever you want. I don't care. In that sense, there is a difference between these two. The first one emphasizes we must still all stand judgment. So you can you can say that you believe different things, but you have to be able to explain yourself. And defend your ideas. But the second one, fine, you can believe whatever you want, is kind of giving up on the idea of true, authentic belief. It's kind of like, OK, you say you believe it, fine, whatever, I don't care uh, a lot. So there, from this very small difference, you have two completely different views of people and the world. The first one accepts that different people will believe different things and that this is perfectly normal and fine. The second one is kind of annoyed that people can't agree on the same thing. So from a very small difference, it's a completely opposite worldview. Sijieguan. Does that make sense? So like uh, today, if I ask uh, one question of group A, uh, group one and group two, and they give opposite answers, the first kind of person will think, hmm, that makes sense. They're different people. They believe different things. The second kind of person will think, well, OK, the, the, so they think one thing, they think another thing. So which one is right? And if you keep saying there's no right answer, then why am I in this class? That's the anyone has a right to his own opinion idea. OK, so uh, back to you guys. How would you describe the difference between relativism and multiplicity? Discussing a subject, but they they think the subject is right or wrong, but they don't have the exact reason to ex to explain it. Like for example, uh, let's say they're talking about Jin, Like, did he plagiarize his research papers? Some people think he did plagiarize it, but they don't have the reason. They don't have the evidence to prove that. They did in fact take the right his research papers. They only think he did, but he, they don't have a certain uh, evidence to explain the reason behind it. I think that's the main difference between uh, the two terms. Uh, one would be they have the evidence to prove, the other one would be they don't have anything to prove, but they just hold an opinion, but they can't prove it. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's a basically good answer. I would add a few things. Um, so when we talk about values and belief, uh, it's kind of hard to come up with proof of value, right? Uh, is this justice? Is this kindness? People will disagree. Um, and you bring up the example of plagiarism. Uh, I think in this debate, everyone agrees what the evidence is, right? The, the thesis is there, you can download it, you can read it, you can compare it. People disagree about whether this similarity should be called plagiarism. So in the end, your example is a good one because it's also about values. What is the value of plagiarism? How unoriginal does your research have to be 
in order to be called plagiarism, right? So it's about the value of originality. Um, so yes, it is, a, in, in one sense, it is about can you explain and defend your belief? Um, but the explanation and the defense does not have to be based on proof. It should be based on uh, consistent belief uh, or personal logic, that kind of thing. Uh, like, uh, if you if we take the same example, why do some people think it's plagiarism because it's not original enough? Why is it bad to not be original? On the other hand, why do people not think it's plagiarism because the similarities are very common in research papers, and so this is not the important part, etc. It's two different values. Uh, but either way, the proof is the same. It's simply what kind of logic do you want to follow? Yeah, OK, good. Uh, thank you. Um, do you want to add something more about this question? Maybe people of the real latest, they just like a group of people who tend to find a standard answer or trying to find a solution. But the people of multiplicity will tend to, they will believe that may, may, maybe there is, there is not such a thing as standard answer in the world. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so um, we can see that the first two questions are actually asking about very similar things. The first question is the shift from right and wrong to maybe there's more than one kind of right and wrong. The second question is shifting from there is a standard answer to this belief to maybe different people will have different answers and that's okay. So it's the same kind of shift. Um, from this, we can move on to question three, group three in the back. Uh, your question is asking whether you agree that the function of a college is to keep asking the same most important questions that have been asked throughout history. And do you agree? Why? Why not? So group three basically says that they agree um, and they offer their own idea of what this statement means. What are these questions that are repeated throughout history? Um, and it, these questions are not just about like the content that you learn in class. Um, if you simply agree with the teacher and you take in the knowledge from the teacher, uh, that seems to be going back to the earlier kind, right? Right and wrong, authority. Um, the bigger questions seem to be things like, why are we here? Why are we doing this? What are we supposed to learn? And why do people want us to learn this? What are some of the basic values and assumptions of this educational system? And is this, uh, are these values what I want for myself? And so these kinds of questions, um, if you're not in college, you might ask about the values of your workplace or of society. If you're 
married and have a family, you might ask about the values of a traditional family. Um, group three th thinks that these big questions are all involving freedom. You can only truly be free if you can choose and you can only choose if you know what your options are. So for group three, these seem to be the biggest questions. And as these questions appear in college, they agree that this is the function of a college to get you to think about these questions. Um, now I'm curious, group three, did you think about the opposite answer? Why somebody might disagree? Yes, no, no. No, OK, um, but it is worth thinking, right? Like, everything I just said sounds so very good. Why would someone disagree? Well, what other functions are there for college? Ah, OK, so while you agree that this thinking makes sense, uh, you also believe that this kind of thinking would only occur to a very sensitive student. Like not your average college student, and that maybe this person is thinking a bit too much. Um, and that's an interesting observation because these are not your average college students, right? They're Harvard students. Um, and so it's uh, from our perspective, uh, we're, I guess, closer to the average, I guess. Um, what might be some other functions of a college? Well, the most straightforward one is you need a diploma to get a job, right? So that's one thing. Um, some people might also say that uh, what you choose to study should prepare you for your future job. Or some future job that's very similar to what you study. Um, and that's one reason why our department is called Applied English, because hopefully once you graduate, you will have the English skills that you need for any job related to English or the kind of job that you want using English. Um, so this does make sense, but it's not the only function of college. Hopefully we can learn many different things at the same time. Um, but there is a deeper question. If the deepest, most basic function of college is to make you think about your environment, think about the value system of your situation, and you really do start to think about it and you start to have questions. Do you think that would affect how you learn the other things? Like if you start to ask questions about capitalism, how are you supposed to keep learning about business English? Right, there seems to be some kind of tension. Right? They don't really go together very well. Yes.
Thank you. That's actually what I was just about to say. Uh, so your classmate answered my question. Thinking about ethics and your situation doesn't seem to go very well with what you should learn to be successful in capitalism. But in fact, if you are able to come to terms with the situation that you are in, if you can find a way to bring these two together, it gives you an advantage over people who have not thought about these questions. Um, it's kind of like you have your midlife crisis early and on purpose. So like when other people start panicking about what is the meaning of their life when they're 40, you've already dealt with all of that. You don't have to deal with that later. Does that make sense? Um, it's the difference between being guided by life and intentionally thinking about your life. Right? Are you active or are you passive? Thank you. Uh, do you, other groups want to add ideas about question three? OK, let's move on to question four. Uh, I know somebody turned off the air conditioning. I know it's kind of cold. It's because of me. I'm very hot. Um, but anyway, question four, group four. Um, the narrative says that the most important thing to learn in college is how to think about your own thinking. So do you agree? Why, why not? And do you think this learning this skill would make your life better? Why, why not? OK, so group four agrees with the first part that college is about how to think, not just what to think. And the reason they agree is because according to group four, college is supposed to be a microcosm of society. So you're supposed to learn how to be an adult in society before entering society. And in society, there are no teachers, uh, there are no guides, there's only somebody to punish you if you make a big mistake. So basically, you have to take responsibility for your own life. What that means is that you can't or you shouldn't simply follow someone's orders or ideas because that person is not you. They may believe something different. If you keep following that person, you may end up in a place you don't want to be. You may have consequences for your life that you do not accept. So you have to be responsible for your own life. You have to make your own decisions. Uh, and so when it says to think about one's own thinking, that is one example. Like what are the consequences? When you think this or when you do this, what kind of effects will this have? And on the other end, why do you think this? Why do you want to do this? Uh, both are part of taking responsibility. Is That's what you guys are saying, yeah? Okay, good. Uh, and as for the second part?
Okay, so yes, the second part they also agree uh, because if you intentionally make choices and take responsibility for your own life, you basically have a clear idea of where you're going and what could happen. Whereas if you don't take responsibility or you don't think clearly about what you believe and what you do, uh, one day you will have to deal with the consequences. And so it's probably better to think about it first rather than having to deal with it later. Right? That's what you're saying? Okay, good. Um, did you have the chance to think about the opposite answer? Yes, okay, so uh, let's start from the second one. How might thinking about your own thinking make life worse? Okay, uh, let me see if I if I understand what you're saying, which is um, success in life depends also on a bit of luck. So if you say we have to take responsibility for our life and you end up not achieving your goals and you think that you have failed, that's too much punishment than you deserve for your decisions. Ah, okay, so what I understand is that um, some people are not prepared to take on that much responsibility. So if the main purpose or like the most important skill to learn in college is how to think about thinking and learn how to take responsibility, under that logic, some people shouldn't go to college because they're not ready and so learning this or trying to learn this will only make them suffer more. Something like that? Partly. OK. Um, we can talk about this in a more general way, which is uh, there is the idea of overthinking, right? Thinking too much about something. Uh, if you, of course, you should think about things clearly and comprehensively. But if you move past that and you overthink and you enter what's called a spiral, and you just revolve around and around, the, the lack of a standard correct answer can drive people crazy, literally. Uh, so at some point, you have to stop thinking and start doing. If you really believe something, uh, you can't just... Um, examine why you believe it for the rest of your life. At some point in your life, you should follow that belief and turn it into action. So for some people, what they believe or what they want from life doesn't require too much complicated thinking. Uh, it's okay not to be ambitious. You don't have to be the top person in your business or in your uh, industry. And if you're happy uh, making enough money to get by and you enjoy like the small pleasures of life, that's also good. Uh, but if you are this kind of person, then thinking too much could be a danger. If you were happy here, but you keep on thinking maybe it could be better and it turns out it's not better, that's a bad result of uh, thinking too much about life, right? 
Um, so again, there's no right or wrong answer um, for each of these questions. It really depends on what you believe uh, and like each person's life situation. Okay, good. Uh, do you guys want to add to this question? Uh, other groups, do you have ideas about this question? OK, let's move on to question five. Group five, your question. Uh, this narrative describes a kind of pathway through college, a kind of growth uh, trajectory. Is this what you want from college? Uh, and if it's not, what other things could people want and how could they get it if the course does not offer it? Uh, so group five is saying that uh, what they really want out of college is to figure out what kind of questions they can ask about their lives. I, uh, all of the big questions we have been talking about so far. Um, but the way to, to formulate those questions, the way to put those questions into words, to find a way to ask those questions it's not usually something you can learn from a class, except for maybe this class. Um, but it's something that you can think about when you take many different classes, you encounter many different teachers and many different classmates, and you think about different subjects, and you start to uh, put them together, to compare them, to try to understand them as a system in your mind. Uh, and so if your courses do not offer what you want, you can think about um, between courses, the space between what you should learn in each class. Uh, on the one hand, you have business English. On the other hand, you have this class. The space in between could be where you can finally come up with the questions that are important for you. And so that's why when we talk about college education, it's not just about the courses that you take. Uh, there's also a focus on clubs and like working part time and like student associations, uh, all of these other parts of college life. If you live in a dormitory or you live uh, in an apartment by yourself, all of these are part of a college education. Um, even if you live at home, now that you are no longer a high school student, your relationship with your family might be a bit different. Uh, the most basic difference is that your uh, daily schedule is different each day. You don't always have to go to school at 8 a.m. and leave at 5 p.m. And so the fact that your schedule is different every day means that you interact with your family a bit differently every day. And from that very, very small difference, there is already a change in your relationship with your family if you live at home while in college. Um, so it's in the spaces between 
between classes, between classroom and dorm, between school and work, and between your personal life and your family life. That is where we can start thinking about these bigger questions. All right, thank you. Uh, group five, do you want to add ideas to this question? Other groups, do you want to add ideas about any of these questions? OK, um, if not, I'm going to introduce. The next unit. And the next unit is we're going to read three personal essays. Uh, what we had just been reading is a psychological report. It's a kind of story, but it's not technically an essay. When we talk about essays from a Western point of view, the personal, okay, so first of all, before the essay was invented, most things were uh, written in verse, ring one. So what today we would call poetry. So uh, if you remember from introduction to British literature, we didn't just read literature. We also read some history. We also read some arguments. Most of those were written in verse. Um, the use of prose sanwen as a kind of writing, so like not verse, not poetry. The use of prose first began uh, to give information or to announce things or like to make arguments, uh, to review poems, to review literature. So these are not personal essays, right? They're written for the public, for a kind of public purpose. The first personal essays were invented by the 15th century or maybe 16th century French philosopher Montaigne, Montaigne. He wrote a book called Essays. In French, it's E-S-S-A-I-S. -S -S. He was French. And in French, the word essays means attempt to try something. What he was trying was he was trying to put his thinking on paper. So if you write an argument essay, as you are writing it, you have different ideas, but you have to put them in order and your essay has to make sense, right? First point, second point, third point, conclusion. But for Montaigne, he wanted to record that process. He wanted to show people what it was like to actually think, not just to give the results of thinking, but to give the process of thinking. And so his essays were not just a collection of information and arguments. They were when he gave himself a topic, he would then include whatever he thought about that topic. He would maybe use personal stories and information, something he read in the morning, something he heard from a friend. And by the end of the essay, it was not always the same topic. And you're not quite sure how he reached that end point. Because that's how we think, right? We don't think in a very logical, orderly way. We think wherever our brain takes us. And that's what Montaigne was trying to record. Um, so if your essay is not very logical and it doesn't prove some kind of point, the only important aspect of that, of that essay is that it comes from a specific person, Montaigne. This is how he thought. A different person might write about the same topic in a very different way. And that's why we call it a personal essay. It's about the author. It's about the author's experience. Um, now, even though it's about a personal experience, the personal essay does not have to be very emotional or subjective. There are also personal essays about the author's intellectual journey, the process of learning about something. Those kinds of personal essays will be filled with more information. But again, it's not like an argument essay. The point is not this is the conclusion. 
is to show you the journey of learning this thing. Um, and so the three essays we are going to be reading um, are technically different kinds of writing. The first is about a personal experience. The second is a kind of argument, but it's an argument based on personal experience. And the third essay is a more informational academic writing, but it's also an intellectual journey based on the author's thinking and learning about the subject. Um, so when we read, uh, like when we read an English textbook, we pay attention to the words and to the meaning, and we're preparing to answer any reading comprehension questions that come later, right? But as you can tell from this class, the questions I will give you will not be reading comprehension questions. They will be based on your own reactions and your own personal ideas about the topic of the essay. Uh, so when you read, take notes about the words and the grammar and uh, to help you remember what the essay is talking about. But you can also think about the author. What kind of person is the author? Why would they care about this? What is their personal connection? And why is that connection important when we are reading this essay? Questions? Right, so next week we're going to be reading an essay called My Year with Jack Reacher. Uh, if you don't know, Jack Reacher is a fictional character. He is the protagonist of a series of crime mystery novels. Uh, he is a loner who goes around the United States fighting bad guys and solving crimes with his mind. So he's strong and he's smart. And uh, those novels are usually not considered high literature. They're not something that you would expect to see in a college classroom. This author uh, is a writer and columnist. She's uh, an agony aunt. And so she thinks a lot about like daily life situations and, and oh. personal issues. Uh, and she found that during the pandemic, when she was in quarantine at home alone, reading these so-called trashy novels, actually helped to keep her mentally sane and stable. It had made her think more deeply about her life. Uh, so we, we're going to follow her journey as she reads these books and thinks about uh, their connection to her personal life. Uh, if you're curious about these novels, there have been two movies starring Tom Cruise. Uh, when Tom Cruise was first chosen to play Jack Reacher, there was a big controversy because Jack Reacher is really tall and Tom Cruise is not. Um, so fans of the book were kind of angry, but I think he does a good job. So if you're interested, you can go watch those movies. I don't promise that they are good movies but they can be fun if you're drunk. Um, so that's next week. Uh, 